My team at Google and I build systems and policies that prevent account takeovers. In this talk, we want to lift some of the veil on how we view this problem and what we do to defend against it. Whether we realize it or not, our accounts are for hijackers a rich source of monetization opportunities, starting from financial information, like bank accounts data, through personal information that can be used for blackmail, lists of our contacts that can be scammed or fished, to even our identity when you, for example, work in accounting and your boss tells you in an email to send money somewhere else, would you double guess it? These monetization opportunities are significant enough that hijacking related headlines appear in news from time to time. Major companies continue to be victims of serious data breaches, exposing billions of credentials in the process. But not only companies and high value targets are affected. In the end, the hijacking problem is about protecting regular users. In this TechCrunch article, the author describes how the hacker got into his Gmail account, logged the offer out, and started scamming his friends. At Google, we want to protect all users from all kinds of threats. And in this talk, I like to focus on the dominating and perhaps most vulnerable form of online authentication, password authentication. What I'd like you to get, walk away with from this talk is that securing passwords in the modern environment requires a defense depth system, one that takes into account the uncertainties that are inside each login. Let's first get an idea of how big the problem really is. The life cycle of hijacking begins with password theft, and there are three main ways this is done. Firstly, passwords can be obtained through data breaches. Secondly, passwords can be stolen by malware. In this particular case, we care about keyloggers. Lastly, passwords, ca passwords can be fished. One particular thing all of these sources have in common is that there are markets associated with them. Hackers often want to sell the data they have stolen to willing buyers. There is also a demand for easy to use malware and easy to use phishing kits. These markets significantly decrease the barrier of entry into the abuse world. There is no need for specialized computer knowledge in, in order to start hijacking global victims' accounts. But the silver lining here is that because there are markets, therefore we can track them. In 2016, we have collected over 4,000 data breach dumps with over 3 billion credentials. This number is dangerous and not only to services that have been breached, but to all account providers. This is because despite ongoing education attempts, the number of users who still reuse their password remain high. Estimates found in literature vary from 12 to 43%. Our own estimate puts this number at 17%. Nowhere is the threat posed by the combination of the sheer volume of uh, data breaches and password reuse more visible than the number of valid Google passwords found in those dumps. So among those 2016 data breaches, there are over 67 million credentials that are also valid Google credentials. Meaning, if our password authentication was only about comparing password hashes, there would be nothing stopping the hijackers into getting into millions of those accounts. And some of these dumps, were a few years old. Dumps often remain valid and valuable until we take an action on them. We also track the two other data sources, and we have evidence that they led to exfiltration of at least 1 million and 12 million credentials, respectively. Just like these three sources differ in volume, they also differ in the success rate. So compared to a general active Google account, if we additionally know that your password was in a data breach, then we estimate that it's at least 10 times more likely that your Google account will be successfully hijacked. This number grows to 40 times for victims of a keylogging attack. And if you are phished, then it is 500 times more likely that your account will be hijacked. The reason why phishing is so much more uh, successful 
is because, as you see, we collect and often ask our users for additional pieces of information, pieces of information that fishers also try to get. Note that these numbers are based on hijacking incidents we are reasonably confident about, and as such are only the lower bound of what's really happening out there. So the password theft ecosystem is thriving. There are tens of thousands of credentials changing hands every day. We fight the hijackers by blocking them at, at every step of the way, starting before they even steal the password. We prevent dissemination of phishing baits and malware by warning users about suspicious content, for example, in Gmail. If the user types or clicks a phishing link, then save browsing. Chrome's security effort may intervene and warn the user from visiting or providing details on such a site. Hackers try to avoid this kind of mechanism. They use things like URL shorteners in Gmail, utilize already hijacked accounts that have some, tr some trust ingrained in them. They also actively probe the machine learning systems that stand behind these protections and try to adapt to them. Whenever we think that a user is at particular risk, we notify them. And when we find out that their password has been compromised, we force them to change it. Otherwise, the password will be circulating in this ecosystem up for grabs by anyone who wants to harm them. Hijackers who have stolen the password need to log in. With millions of stolen passwords out there, just accepting the password as it is is risky at best. Preferably, users would turn on additional security mechanisms that we offer, things like second factor authentication. But the truth is, such opt-in security mechanisms just don't get adopted on a wide enough scale. Less than 10% of active Google users use second factor authentication and only 12% of Americans um, report using password managers. This is not enough. But there are good reasons for this state of affairs. Firstly, as you have heard yesterday, um, there are privacy implications of sharing your phone with an online service. There are perhaps security implications of storing your passwords in one place. But most importantly, it's about convenience and usability. It's perceived as an unnecessary hassle to set up additional security from one's account. There's also a worry, what will happen if we lose our security key? Will we lose access to our own account? So there's this gap, security gap, between password-only authentication and two-factor authentication. In order to bridge this gap, we look at additional signals available to us at login time. The signals that we look at can be grouped into two categories. The first, the first category of signals are signals of how surprised we are to see you log in the way you are logging in, where there's any deviation from your login patterns. The second category is how risky does your login look like? Does it, does it match any known hijacking campaign or hijacking behavior? Or perhaps we know that a, the particular attacker is targeting you. This risk assessment mechanism, mechanism has been at Google since 2011. And just like anything security, there's a constant arms race here. For instance, once we and other account providers started using geolocation in the login process, hijackers noted that. Nowadays, over 80% of phishing kits collect geolocation information. And some hijackers have learned to use proxies effectively, such that we had trouble detecting that they were geocloaking themselves. It was slowly becoming some hijackers' favorite way of fooling our systems. In the end, we had to ratchet down its importance, and we even turned it off for users that don't seem to need it, based on their past behavior. We use the risk assessment in order to decide whether we should ask our password-only users uh, for additional, additional proofs, additional pieces of information. And these requests we call challenges. So we challenge our users whenever we detect, whenever we think that the login is risky. And we only challenge them in such a way that they should be able to solve it. In effect, these password-only users uh, these users that are not de facto rolled in to second factor authentication are in a state that we call dynamic second factor authentication. That is, they may still have to solve a challenge in order to log in, but such requests happen much more rarely, 
and they depend not only on the settings of the account, but also on the particular properties of the login. This challenging part of the system is where risk is most visible, because we can never really be certain whether the person behind the login is the legitimate user or just the hijacker, or hijacker who just hides really well. We can also never really know whether a user will not be particularly inconvenienced by the challenge and will not be able to solve it. This risk translates to real damage. If we make a mistake and let the hijacker in, he may wreak havoc inside the account. On the other hand, if we are too strict, the user might be locked out of their own account. In order to react appropriately, we strive to build an arsenal of challenges so that we always have a suitable option for a given situation. I like now to share with you some of the lessons learned from these challenges. Please remember that while I'll be fo focusing on their weaknesses, the end goal here is not perfect, bulletproof security, but a usable one. We want to provide the best security even for a basic account. The first kind of challenge is, is secondary email verification, where we send the verification code to the secondary email associated with the account. What we found out is that 10% of our users have problems solving this challenge. The reasons vary. Forgotten password to email, or even secondary, secondary email provider no longer existing. This number shows how costly it is for us to challenge anyone. We have to be really careful about whom and when do we challenge. This is also the reason why we often combine multiple challenges, so that users may choose a suitable option for them. Secondary email verification is also vulnerable to password to use. It's not uncommon for hijackers to try the same password across multiple accounts and use already hijacked accounts as stepping stones. The second kind of challenge that I'd like to present is SMS code challenge. In this challenge, we send the verification code to the phone number associated with the account. This challenge is vulnerable to phishing in the sense that phishers try to intercept this code. Around 80% of phishing kits try to collect it. But what's more worrisome is that there are, more, there are multiple other ways hijackers can get their hands on this challenge, ways we or the users has, have little control over. Just like in the case I mentioned at the beginning, the author of that article had a two-factor authentication account with an SMS code set up. What the hijacker presumably did is he presumably called uh, the, cost, the customer service at his phone carrier and tricked them into cloning his SIM. In effect, all the SMS codes we sent to the user were intercepted by the hijacker. And it's a general trend. Most successful hijackings of valuable two-factor authentication accounts involve breaking the SMS code. And make no mistake, this affects not only targeted hijacks, but also opportunistic ones, when the data was found in a data breach or has been fished. As for the volume of this kind of attack vector, FTC reports that in January 2016 alone, there are over 2,500 phone hijackings in the United States. Now, don't get me wrong, SMS has its weaknesses, but it still raises the security bar, especially for run of the mill accounts. Nevertheless, we promote more secure challenges, like the Google Prompt, where we ask the user to verify the login or the, on their smartphone device. The user may still click the yes button when he's man in the middle, for example, but it doesn't suffer the infrastructural weaknesses that SMS has. It also gives us wider field for maneuvering. We can present additional information to the user. We can also do things like correlate IP of the login with the IP of the device to see whether something fishy is going on. Most hijackers are stopped at login, but some do get in. And when that happens, our focus changes from prevention to remediation. Hijackers who get in usually want to monetize by stealing data, performing scams, performing in product abuse. Because they want to monetize, they have to perform specific actions, actions we can monitor for. Whenever we note that something suspicious is going on, we notify the user. Unfortunately, this channel of communication is just too slow. Hijackers who get in often come in with a prepared script of what they want to do, and it's a race against time. So we rely instead on automatic pipelines that detect ongoing attacks. Consider, for instance, typical things hijackers do when they get into Gmail. 
after they log in, they like to delete the notifications that we have sent to the user, so that the user remains unaware of what's going on. Then they start looking for valuable information. Nowadays, it will be things like bitcoins or intimate photos. Then they may export the list of user contacts in order to widen the list of, pot of future potential victims. They may then use the account in order to send phishing links or scams. And just before they log out, they set up filters so that the user never find out about the attack, and perhaps they can reuse the account for later. Whenever our systems detect an attack taking place, they block the account in such a way that the hijacker cannot get back in, but the user, by providing additional information, can. And this concludes our journey from password theft to monetization. Thanks to the system I've just described, most hijackers never get to deal any lasting damage. So we see now how passwords may seem like a simple and binary mechanism on the outside, but in the back end, they are a complex and dynamic system, and they have to be in order to make online authentication work. Thank you.